okay, you just had food, so I'm not going to go too much into hardcore code because most of the time you're just after food, 10 minutes later, you're like, Ugh, what the hell is he on about? So I'm talking about using YQL sensibly, not in a silly fashion like you normally would be doing it. And it's all about the caching, collating, and filtering data. Uh, um, when YQL came out, I was actually a bit wary about it because it sounded like this magical thing that solves all your problems. And funnily enough, it is. And uh, it's actually quite annoying that they always come up with great things you want to talk about while you're still explaining to the world what they've done two months ago that was already amazing. And um, so YQL is a big, big, vast field to do. What I'm going to talk about here, though, is not like YQL itself and all the things you can do, but what can go wrong when you use it and how to avoid these traps that people have all the time when they use web services with JavaScript. So the first thing that I always want to ask myself, what is the web? And you get so many different answers. I just been at an entrepreneur conference at, um, in Romania, and they had completely different ideas what the web is. It's like, it's not a cash cow. It's actually a media. It's where good data is there, and you give out things for free, and good things will come back to you if you do. So for me, the web is always data and interface. And it doesn't really matter what that is. That could be a command line interface. That could be a great website. That could be a HTML5 canvas interface. This could be a flash interface. This could be a mobile phone app. It's all about the data that you have and the interface that you provide. And where it normally falls apart is in between those two. People don't think about the data up front. They just build an interface with some information in it. And then out of a sudden, they have to scale, or the interface has to change, and that means four months of work, rather than 10 minutes of work if they had thought about an API before. So the web is lots of yummy, yummy data. There's so many things out there for you to play for free with. And I don't know any other market where that is the, where that is the way. If you're in investment banking, you're probably not going to get a database from a competitive bank for free to play with. On the web, that can happen. Like Google releases stuff, Apple releases hardware, we release free APIs, all kind of people do great stuff for the web. And you can play with that. If you look at a programmable web, for example, there's like over 1,700 APIs to play with. And all of them come with more or less documentation and some things that you, how you can access them. But you can spend a lot of time trying to read what people thought was documentation. Instead, you could also use YQL. So everybody benefits from APIs. That's what people keep forgetting. So as uh, companies... If you build an API and you give your data out, people implement your information in environments that you never reached before. I mean, I give out my texts as Creative Commons. People translate them into Chinese and Arabic, which I'm not that good at. So possibly it, these markets would never have heard of me. But as I gave them out for free, that works that way. As we give out our weather stuff for free, our maps API, our geo stuff, people build implementations of our data that we hadn't thought of. And YUI is the best example for this. If you build something as cool as YUI and you give it out for free, and then you make a gallery where people can build things, it becomes better and better and bigger every year. What you saw from Eric earlier, the numbers of the YUI, is only possible because we gave it out. We couldn't have bought all these people to build these little things in the gallery. We had to give it out for free. As developers, I can actually build products without buying data or writing extra code. So a lot of the information of the SDKs out there have functionality that I have no clue about how to write that. But I just get the data back because somebody wrote a converter for me. So let's play with two examples and solving problems with them. And, you know, as developers, we love solving problems. And if we don't find any, we, can, we come up with them. And then we discuss on Slashdot for a long, long time that they are really problems that should be solved. So one of the things is I build a system to calculate the distance between two places on Earth. Sounds simple, but it's actually quite a useful feature. Like if I want to go somewhere, it would be good to know how many miles I have to drive. So you can use a web service for that. I can go to Google Maps, type in Sunnyvale to San Francisco, say I want to walk, bad idea. Say I want to drive, it gives me the distance between the two places. Now, uh, if you take further steps, that's a bit of a problem. If you ever tried China to Japan in Google Maps, there's one uh, entry number 72 is like a, a jet ski across the ocean for 6,000 miles. It's like, they have humor at Google, really, sometimes. So... The problem is like, yeah, that's an interface. I type that in and I have it once. But it would be better if I could get the raw data of that. And I also want to know more information about the, inf the, uh, the, the, um, the places that I typed in. I want to see that Sunnyvale is Sunnyvale, California, not Sunnyvale, South America, or wherever there might be one. So it's a simple plan. You find the location of the two places on Earth, and you calculate the distance between the two of them. 
simple enough. So Earth data, every time I hear about this, I think of Yahoo GeoPlanet. I also think of GeoNames, but GeoPlanet is great because it's a curated, filtered, and sorted data set of every place on Earth. So if you go to Yahoo GeoPlanet, you, can, you realize that you can download that data set, or you have an API where you can actually point to, and it tells you where a certain place is. GeoPlanet does the disambiguation for you. So if you type in, for example, a city in Spanish, it will also realize it's actually the same city that you were looking for in English. It also will find out, it will give you all the places with the, uh, with the same name and gives you the one that you're, that you're nearest to first. So, for example, Springfield. There are, I think, 130 of those in America. That's why Springfield and Simpsons was too chosen, so you never know where it is. So what you have to do with GeoPlanet is you have to go through a developer registration field. And you have to fill in the form. You say your name, your product name, where the URL is, uh, your contact email that will be dead next month. It's a good thing that that. Um, and then what your application does, and then continue. So you sign up for developer key. That's almost every API out there. It's sometimes really annoying, like uh, a Firefox, Firefox extensions I can write immediately, Chrome extensions I can write immediately, Apple extensions for Safari I have to sign up as an Apple developer. Not without a paycheck, sorry. So once you've, so once you've signed up, you got your key, you actually get the data back where you can basically point something, yahooapis.com, places, give me Warsaw and Poland, with the app ID and the format JSON, and I get the data back as JSON with a latitude and longitude and a bounding box. Important bounding box, if you want to display a map, you don't want just a latitude and longitude because that will zoom down to the lowest level rather than showing the whole of Warsaw. So now I have latitude and longitude, which is good, but um, somehow it gets into that creepy geo um, engineering math 3D thing that I'm not quite sure about. So how do I get the distance between two places where I got the latitude and longitude? Of course, you can read it up. You can write a book. You can read a book. You can do it, or you can do it like me, and you just Google it, and you find that somebody has wrote, written a great movable TypeScript seven years ago. Something useful coming out of movable type. Who would have known? <laughs> and um, yeah, JavaScript. He gave it out for free. I copied and pasted that function, and I was done with it. And then I put this all together. So I say, okay. I start with just my data that I want to get back uh, uh, as, a, as nulled out. Then I have a function that basically writes out a HTML form that gives me two locations. I do an onSubmit on that form, get the values back, check that values were entered, and then call a function called getDistance with the two values, and a result function as a callback from that whole thing. I call the getDistance function, which calls the get function twice. This is all, uh, all online, so don't get too worried about it. I put my, oops, that was not what I wanted to do. I put my um, URL together that I had here earlier. And you already see the problem here that my key is readable in the source code. And that's probably not a good idea, because you didn't sign up for me. And if you actually exceed the allowed uh, uh, access per day, I get, I get the blame. I create a script node. I call it. I have a callback function called data in, which actually reads if there was some data coming back, and then reads if one of them came back, then if the other one came back, and I actually seed the object that I give back, and then I call the function, the distvincenzi function, that's the one that I got from that movable type guy, and I get that information back. Distvincenzi, I just shortened here because it's massive, and then I call my init function, and I'm done. And as you can see, I'm a really, really gifted graphical designer. That's why it's so beautiful right now. So I know that between London and Warsaw, it's 1,453 kilometers, about 900 miles. So few annoyances with this. I've got multiple script generation. So I call at one time with Warsaw, the other one with, Poland, uh, with London. So I've got two scripts, and I never know, will they come back in the right order? Will one of them time out? Will there be an error in one of them? And of course, the access key is readable in the source. And that's just not good quality code. And what we want to do is good quality code. <laughs> so building a system to translate foreign tweets was the other thing that I thought about. Because I go out to all these conferences in like Portugal, Brazil, Bo Poland, with all these funny languages that are not based on Latin. And um, then I get these tweets. Like I just gave a talk, and this tweet comes in, and I'm like, did he like my talk, or did he insult my mother? I'm not quite sure yet. <laughs> so what can, do with, can we do with this? Twitter is multilingual, but it doesn't translate for you. There's no translate button on Twitter, which confuses me because it's such an easy thing to build nowadays. So Google, on the other hand, has a translation service. And it has a, a, an Ajax API for it that you can call. 
And so the simple plan is investigate Twitter search API and Google's translation API. If needed, get keys, which you need to get. Get the results from Twitter for a certain search, loop over the results and see which them are not in English and then translate them with the Google translation API. That's the plan. Really not that much difference in code to the other one. Again, I have to write some script nodes, call some JSONP objects, get the data back, filter it out, loop through it, and I get the same annoyances though. Uh, actually even more than before, because asynchronous lookups with generated script nodes are hard to get right. What if one of them times out? What if one of them crosses before the first one? Depending on how many tweets are not in English, you also hammer the Google API. The Google API has a certain amount of hits that you're allowed every hour or so, so you might get your application blocked really quickly. And there's nothing more annoying than, for example, a Twitter client that says, like, you over overdone the quota, please wait for an hour. That's not what we have Twitter for. So we have to find a way to actually make sure that you don't hammer the API from your client's machine too much, because also if I generate 50, uh, uh, 50 script nodes and call back the Google API, that really slows down my interface, that slows down my application. So YUI fixes a few of those issues. If you look at YUI for the JSONP object, for example, the JSONP module, for example, it can also provide timeouts for these calls. So instead of just creating a script node and hoping everything is fine, you get a callback object and you get an ID for every transaction and so on and so forth. Because we all know YUI rocks. Still, it would be nice to have one request, though. I don't want to hammer Google. I don't want to have like 6,000 script nodes generated and hoping they come back in the right order. So simplifying the access is what YQL does for you. So YQL... Uh, probably, who has not seen YQL here yet? Good. That's the console. You play with it. You put things together. You copy and paste them out. You're happy. Select what from where, where conditions is the simple language that YQL has. We know that. So how about the foreign tweets issue that we said before? So select text from Twitter search where query equals FT 2010, which was the Front Trends 2010 conference in Warsaw, Poland, and the ISO language code equals PL. So that gets me all the tweets that are actually written in Polish, so I don't understand them and I want to translate them. I take this query and I put it inside another query where I can say select star from Google Translate, where Q in, the other statement, and target equals English. So what I'm doing here, I'm using the Twitter API without knowing what, what it is or if I have to sign up for it. I'm using the Google API without having to know where it is and without having to sign up for it. And I do the job that I talked about in like one line of code. And I point it to the endpoint and I'm done with that. So that goes even further. Like I love to, I love open data. I've been part of the UK government open data initiative. I've been working with The Guardian. I've been working with a lot of people that want to give out things for free because I think this is what the web is about. So the Guardian has this wonderful data blog. It's a newspaper in England that every Sunday has this massive spread of like great charts of some data that they collected. And instead of just giving you that chart and sell the newspaper, they also release that data on the web as a spreadsheet on Google Docs. So this was the Winter Olympics medals, all the Winter Olympics won since from 1924 up to now in comparison. So they put that on Google Docs, and I'm like, ooh, Google Docs. So I saved a copy for myself and say publish this web page. As soon as I publish this web page, I get different formats. I get what Google considers HTML. I get CSV. I get XML. I get JSON. So CSV is a great format because it's comma-separated values, and it's really easy to read and really small. So I use spreadsheets, google.com, and this wonderful URL that's very readable uh, gives you this as a CSV file. I could then use YQL to say select star from CSV, where URL is that wonderful URL, and you can name the columns, and then you can also start uh, already start mixing. You say, instead of just getting all the data back, and that's a massive data set, and then having to find out where the year is 1924, I do that in YQL, and I only get the data back from that year. So this is how I actually mix and match all these metals and build this interface on top of it, which is using YUI 3 to actually allow you to get, have pop-ups and filter them down and check all of them so you can comp compare all these different... Uh, medals next to each other. So that one I released when the Winter Olympics started, like a week after, and I made uh, lots of money with ads, about £3.50 in a week or something like that. So Google Ads is your only monetization option, not quite yet anymore. So instead of getting crazy filtering and sorting in JavaScript yourself, because you can do it, do it in YQL, because then you have a chance to actually just get the data back that you need. 
and you can write a JavaScript that is really simple and you don't have to do any filtering or sorting or functioning yourself. YQL is very powerful to basically allow you to get all kind of information and filter it. So using web services with YQL in JavaScript is really easy because it's a web endpoint on its own. So JSONP is what you get. Here's your URL. You give it a YQL with a URI encoded query. Format XML or JSON. Diagnostics, true or false. That always tells you what's happening under the hood. A callback function name and a environment store which tells you which tables to actually use. Box standard JSONP call function to get data from YQL is... Uh, I create a script node, and uh, I see if a script node has already been created, and if it's there, then I remove it. Otherwise, I point to the YQL endpoint, I create a script node, give it the ID, add it to the head of the document, and so on and so forth. So every time you call that, it creates a script node, calls the call function, the callback function, and you're done. Special case HTML scraping. We, uh, who saw, those who saw um, Dave earlier realized that HTML scraping is a real pain to actually get right because regular expressions writing for the things that people consider HTML is just painful. In YQL, you've got an HTML table where you can scrape content, which is really, really useful. For example, this is one of my talks that I've given in Amsterdam the other day, and I wanted to know all the URLs that I, that I had in there because I never know my slides. I wrote this this morning at 5 o'clock, so I just wanted to get all the URLs out so I can write a blog post so you can click on them rather than having to go through the PDF. So what I did is I, I, uh, what, what SlideShare does for you, it actually creates an ordered list of all your slides of the text that it finds in the slides. And that text is actually OCR scanned, which is terribly useful if you want to make your slides accessible for people. They do it for SEO reasons, of course. So all I had to do is go into my Firebug and say, okay, where is that list? It's an OL with a class transcripts, and it's H transcripts, so it actually is a microformat for all the three people that use them. And so you say select star from HTML, where URL is the URL to my slides, and XPath is O-L-L-I-P, where it contains HTTP in the first child of that element. Yes, XPath is a bit like throwing up alphabet soup, but there's good documentation out there, and you will find your information. And what that one does, it actually goes to SlideShare, gets the HTML, runs it through HTML tidy to turn it into real XML-compliant HTML, and then allows me with XPath to filter down only to the thing that you need. So even if the website that you're trying to scrape was built with .NET, real HTML will come out. Um, so this is the result. I just get all these links that I've been writing about, and then I just copied and pasted that back into my blog and started writing my blog post. You can automatically create that in a WordPress uh, plugin if you want to as well. Lanyard is a really, really cool website right now that talks about conferences and allows you to track conferences and where people have spoken. And they didn't have a badge. So I used basically YQL to do the same thing here. I just had this, created this badge from just scraping the website. And this would have been quite a job to get that right if you had done that in JavaScript alone. But with YQL, it was really easy. Problem, though, is that HTML coming back as JSON is just not fun because uh, you don't know what's a child element, what is an attribute, unless it starts with an add attribute, and it's just a painful thing to have a massive JavaScript object that you have to put together in a string to render it out as HTML. The benefit of YQL is that it comes with JSONPX, which is HTML as a string in a JSONP container. What does that mean if you implement it? This is the whole code for that Lanyard badge. This is all I had to write to scrape that thing and paint something with it, and a bit of CSS. So um, I get an element with the ID Lanyard, which is a link. I test if it's a link. I set the inner HTML to loading, so I give the people already an interface saying, like, okay, there's something happening here, rather than just hoping that they know they're not going to click that thing. I get the attribute href. I put the URL together, which is just copied and pasted from the, uh, from the YQL console. I call the lanyard batch seed function when I'm done. I create a script node, put it in the head, done. Function seed gets an object back, and the result zero is a string. So all I have to do is clean up that string a bit, set the inner HTML, done. So you can scrape any HTML from the web, turn it into JSON, get it back as a string, and inner HTML it out. And that's quite powerful. So that's on GitHub as well. As the format is XML and the callback is lanyard batch seed, it becomes a string inside a JSON object rather than a JSON object itself. Using YQL reuse of web content is very easy indeed. And I use it, for, my, for example, for my portfolio page. Instead of maintaining it, I just maintain it on the web. 
I upload a new SlideShare element somewhere. At, I scrape the RSS from SlideShare. I get things from my blog. I put together my portfolio from using the web rather than going there and editing it myself. YUI3's YQL query makes it even better, as we've seen before, YQL rocks. And look at that one. It's by Dave Glass, so it has absolutely um, amazing input already. Now, using YQL and especially using JSONP with JavaScript, opt uh, JavaScript libraries can be dangerous because there are some things under the hood that are just annoying about the JSONP format. So the first thing that people do wrong is that they just uh, rely on the data arriving. They just do a callback function with data and then they start looping over that immediately. And when the data hasn't arrived, then actually the loop breaks and you have a JavaScript error. And that makes people cry. That's a bad thing. So you just test if the data query has... Oops. If the data query has arrived, and if the data query has a result, and then you start with your looping over it. It's a simple if statement, but it makes a difference between something that breaks and something that works. And if statements are great. That's why we don't have them in CSS. So here's fighting words right now. Um, uh, uh, Simon Willison, the man that wrote Lanyard, was very confused and very annoyed with YQL that it actually had this problem. Converting XML to JSON makes XML useful, but it also has a problem because JSON doesn't come with a schema. In XML, I have a schema. I know what something is, whereas in JSON, I never know what something is. I just have to hope to, that it comes in the right format. When will that be a problem? So say you have an XML document which lists awesome things. You've got unicorns, narwhals, lasers, baby elephants, and capybaras. Biggest rodent on this planet, absolutely awesome animals. As uh, JSON, much, much smaller, awesome things are an object with a things uh, um, array in it where you just list all these things in there. Great, I can loop over that, everything works fine. Now, what if it's only one element? In XML, I have an awesome things and a thing inside. With uh, a JSON, it becomes a property. It's not an array anymore. So when you just loop over that, it will not work unless you use a for each uh, sugar thing. If you just do a for loop, it will actually sell, tell you, like, that's not an array. Why do you try to loop over that one? And that is what actually threw Simon. And the problem is there's no way out. You don't know if something is an array, so it actually is an array of an array with one element, or if it's just a property. So when you convert XML to JSON, you either make everything an array with one or many elements, or you make a property if it's only one and you start with an array if it's more than two. And this problem has to be solved and lots of people are complaining about it and it's going to be endless discussions on mailing lists and it's just going to be painful because you just have sometimes to say there's no way of, no, of fixing this unless we have a schema in JSON. And having a schema in JSON is where we turn JSON into XML land, which we don't want because we came up with JSON because it's much easier. So using JSON is easy with libraries. JSON Pay and jQuery for, jQuery, for example, has a wonderful little short, uh, <coughs> short note function called getJSON, where I give it a URL and a callback function equals question mark, and then a function that gets called when the data gets actually retrieved. This is the short way in jQuery to get something with JSON from, a, uh, from an endpoint. There's also a longer version of it, where you just do an AJAX request, where you define a URL, a data type is JSONP, a callback, and the JSONP callback function with a name called oh yeah, and then you have this function oh yeah data here. Annoying, too much code to write. I mean, it always fascinates me when people are like, I wrote shorter code than you, and that's like five levels of abstraction. It's okay, try to debug it then. But people say get JSON is much better, and it's actually dangerous. Which one to use is the question. Get JSON is dangerous with other people's data. The reason is the way it works under the hood. And the same with YQL, uh, with YUI, and we're working on that right now. The AJAX call will create this URL. So any URL to data endpoint format JSON callback is oh yeah. The get JSON function will have a format JSON callback, JSON P, and a random number. Because this is how get JSON, uh, get JSON works. It just creates a script node with a function name in it and destroys the script node as soon as the data came back. And as this has to be unique every time, it creates a single string. And what that means is actually that it breaks the cache and makes bunnies cry. Because YQL works better when you request the same data with the same URL. It gives it to you from cache rather than from, again, going to the databases and the web services and so on and so forth. 
So if you use getJSON, you every single time you get a new YQL request, which means that you could be blocked if you do more than 10,000 in an hour or whatever the limitation is. If you use an AJAX call, that doesn't happen because it's coming from cache. Cache breaking is not a good idea. Local caching, on the other hand, is a great idea. So local caching, when you use PHP or Python or Ruby or if you stick Java and you actually call web services on the web, local caching is always a good idea because you call the first time, you get data back. The second time you get it, you don't have to worry if it works. You still have something to fall back on. Now, if we do everything in JavaScript and client side, we don't have this opportunity because cookies actually suck. Cookies are the, is the only way, or used to be the only way, of storing things on a client's machine. And the syntax is just annoying. You have to connect it with a domain. It's just there. So it would be good to have a better solution for that. If cookies would not be the only solution. So let's ask the kitty fairy if there is a better solution for it. And if you look at HTML5, there is one. And it's called local storage. And local storage is basically cookies on steroids. So instead of having the 4K that you have in cookies, you have a 5 to 15 Mac, depending on which environment, and you can do, use it really, really easily. You test if local storage is supported. If local storage in window or window local storage is not null, browser issues, blah, blah, blah. Then you say local storage, set item, cake is much better than cookies. So there will be now a section in the local storage called cake, and it has the value much better than cookies. And you read it out by saying, like, what equals local storage get item cake, and that means what is going to be much better than cookies. That's how easy as it is, and you can store 15 Mac on that. That is, uh, I don't know why we don't use it in every bloody product by now, because every new browser supports it. Internet Explorer 9, I think, as well, but I can't test it because i got a Mac. So... Local storage only uses strings, though. So if you want to use JSON, you have to use the native JSON in browsers or the JSON that you have to put in if it's not supported to work around that. So you do JSON stringify for, that, for an object to set it, and you can actually parse it by reading it. Why it's stringify and parse and not encode and decode? You have to ask uh, Douglas Crockford about this. So instead of having object object, you have the real object if you use JSON parse and stringify. So let's wrap it up in a function. And I'm not going to go through the source code, but this function is on GitHub for you. And um, it would be good if we, uh, uh, when I get the time, I actually put it into the uh, repository of YUI3. So now, instead of just using a, using a YQL call, like we have in YUI3 right now, you can say, this is my YQL query. This is the ID that it will get in local storage. And this is the cache age that I want to have. So give me an hour of caching and a callback function that actually gets called every time I request the data. I now have a, vacu uh, a, a cache age and a callback. The data that comes back is for browsers supporting local storage, fetch the data only every hour. And when I request it again, I get it from my own machine. So instead of hammering YQL for every reload when the data hasn't changed, I only get one access per hour, and the rest comes from the user's machine, and the interface is so much faster. So data that doesn't change much, perfect example for that. If you do a Twitter live search, of course, you don't want caching. So others still work, but they load the data every time. So Internet Explorer 6 will still do the request, will still give you the data back, but Internet Explorer 6 users should suffer. So callback gets an object with two parameters. There's the data, which is the, the data, and there is a type, which is cached, if it came, comes from the cache. Live, if it couldn't be cached, if the browser supports it or there was a, uh, doesn't support it or there was an error retrieving it. And fresh cache, if it just has been newly fresh, uh, freshly loaded. So this is, uh, you can take this type property to actually change the different callbacks that you need. Libraries offer storage fallbacks for legacy browsers via Flash. YUI is one of them. So if you want to use the YUI storage instead of using my thing, great. Then you also support others that have just Flash and, and, and bad old browsers. So... Once you have all this stuff, how about offering your own API with YQL? To get your own API into YQL, all you need to do is write an XML schema and put it on GitHub. Done. We uh, shift it over to datatables.org, we check it if it's okay, and then we put it into YQL. So github.com, YQL, YQL tables is the repository. There's a great documentation on YQL, how to write your own open tables. There's going to be a talk tomorrow about it as well. And YQL allows you to write executable tables. This means you can get data from YQL and use JavaScript to convert it to something. 
that's really cool because actually instead of doing all these things on the, on the client side that we talked about earlier, hitting the Google API 10,000 times, you can make the YQL server do that for you. So it means you can convert data with JavaScript that will be executed server side. Our earlier examples as YQL queries, for example. Twitter translate. You start with your XML, uh, a meta with a sample query, an author, a documentation URL where you actually can read up on your API, a good description. Please put these things in, otherwise you make people confused and we have to call you back and say, like, why isn't that in there? Uh, then you have your bindings where you can say what's coming back, JSON results as it re comes back in XML. Then you have the keys that you want to have. So in this case, I've got a language, I've got a search, and I've got an amount. And then I start my execute block, and in that execute block, I write JavaScript. As the JavaScript is executed on the server, I have much more things to play with than in the browser, because I don't have to worry about support. So in this case, I now do a YQL query in YQL inside an open table with myself, where I can say select star from JSON, where URL is search twitter.com, search JSON, search, and the RPP is the amount that came through, and results JSON is the data that I want back. So all the things that came from the keys are already available for me as JavaScript variables. So amount and search came from the two keys we defined beforehand. I then have my rows. I then have a for each command where I can actually ro uh, re uh, loop over everything. And I turn the results text to string. I replace any uh, backslashes because there was a problem with that. And then I do another query in YQL where I can say select star from Google Translate where query equals text and target, target equals target language. I get the data back from Google. I translate it back to a string. I put, uh, I put the backslashes in again. And then I actually add to the results that came back from the first query a translated text element. So uh, YQL in, on the server supports E4X. We're using Rhino as the JavaScript engine, which is useful if you want to create XML. It's also annoying because we can't use V8, which is much, much faster, or Jagermonkey, but we're working on that. And yeah. If you try that now, you can say select star from Twitter translate where language is English and search is Warsaw, which is the Polish name for Warsaw, and the amount is 20. And when you get the results back from, uh, from Twitter, you now have a new element added to each of these results called translated text, where I translated the Pogoda blah, blah, blah into weather in Warsaw. So now I made, why, uh, I made Twitter international with my own little table. Instead of my, my client suffering, it's actually YQL server suffering, and that's not a bad idea because your clients shouldn't suffer. And YQL server was built to suffer. And you see how much it suffers. If you look at the, uh, at the, uh, at the uh, thing, at the, what's it called again? The, um, the diagnostics block that shows you how many times we actually hit the uh, Google Translation API. If you do that from your own PHP or from your client machine, the Google server might say, meh. Not really, don't give you anything anymore. With the YQL server, they're like, hey, you're a friend of mine, it's all good. <laughs> Distance example, same thing. Uh, I got my sample query, I've got my blah, 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 I've got my keys, place one and place two. They're required, so if you, if you, say, if you don't send any of them, YQL gives you an error back. And then you need an XML namespace, because XML is for you to suffer, not for you to get data back. So you have to define the XML namespace, you get a query where you do a geo places with the geo planet API that I showed you earlier for the first and the second place. Get the latitude and longitude. Do the disvincenti function that we called about earlier, the one that I got from movable type. And then uh, render it down to miles, convert the miles to kilometers, and give back the XML with that data. So if you now put this into a YQL statement, it selects star from geo distance where place one is London and place two is Warsaw. And it gives you back the information that is 903 miles or 1,453 kilometers and has all kind of information about the different places as well. So as I said before, I want to know the distance, but also what these places are about. This is the result for both of these problems. You then build a beautiful interface again between the two, and you basically can get, use Google Maps to show where they are and how much distance is between them with all the information. And you can also test things like the distance between Batman and Robin, because Batman is a great city in, uh, in Turkey. So how do you use your own JS tables if you don't want to wait until we actually put it from GitHub to our own servers? It's quite easy because uh, you write your own schema, you put it on the web, and then you use use to use it. Write a parser for that to understand that. 
So you say use my URL uh, distance.xml as distance and then you select star from distance where place one is London and place two is Warsaw and you get the same information back and you can test it from your own server until you're happy with it and then you put it on GitHub so we can actually copy it over for you. So we had these problems at the beginning where we said like what's the distance between two places? We had the problem that Twitter doesn't understand any other language but the beautiful English that you in America don't speak as much as the people in England. So we released them, and we released them as an API to the world without having to do anything ourselves. We piggybacked on Yahoo's infrastructure. We used JavaScript to write converters, and we just put it inside an XML file instead of writing, buying our own server farm or, farm or renting it from Amazon or all kind of things that you have to go through. So you can be your own API on the web just by using JavaScript, and that is as cool as this 80s family. I mean, people get so excited about this. This is what JavaScript and APIs is all about. What the hell? So, in summary, use YQL instead of wasting time reading API docs for a simple task. I don't want to sign up for Yahoo GeoPlanet just to look up one, pay, one country. I can do that through YQL. Filter data in the service and get the info back in formats you need instead of writing your own JavaScript filtering functions and looping over stuff. Use the fast YQL server instead of doing lots of requests. So as I showed you, 50 requests to the Google Translation API from your mobile phone interface is probably not a good idea. From the YQL server, it comes back already cached for you, already expiring header set and all kind of things. I've got this YQL speed comparison on Twitter, uh, on Twitter, on GitHub that you can download as well and it shows you how to pull five different RSS feeds from different servers on the planet and how long it takes with, with, uh, uh, with simple curl, with multi-curl and how, much it, how fast it is with YQL. And sometimes there were differences with like 10 seconds with simple curl to 0.8 seconds with YQL because the YQL server farm is faster on the web than your server. Not the giant guys, they're probably faster, but fair enough. So write your own JS APIs using Execute. So even if it's just a clever functionality converter, don't, you can actually, instead of just putting it somewhere as a form field or a JavaScript, put it inside an Execute block and it becomes part of YQL and you become already part of the YQL infrastructure where people go to find APIs rather than having to go through Google to find your server. Use local storage and don't break caching. So JSON, uh, get JSON, uh, Good for simple JSON on your own server, bad for web services because it creates a new URL every single time you request it, which breaks caches, which makes bunnies cry. We saw that before. You don't want to make bunnies cry. And go and use the web. Use the web for building your stuff rather than just building something and putting it on the web. As I showed you before with the Winter Olympics medals, I use Google for storing. I use YQL for converting. All I have to do is actually write an HTML document that goes on my server and I reap the rewards. And it's going to be really easy editable for me. Instead of writing my own content management system to edit the CSV file, I just go to Google Docs. They built it for that. Why not use it? And YQL is there to convert data for Yahoo internally, and we gave it out to the world, so use it as well. And the last thing to think about is go easy on the effects, as they are annoying, as you just saw in these, these bullet points. <laughs> and that is all I wanted to talk about, so thank you very much. <laughs>